we're on, people of the internet, good to have you. Um, I just want to remind everyone to continue to uh, go to odyssey.com and find us there as well. That gives us credit and that gives our uh, video guy in, in Tulsa more uh, leeway when you get more credit on it. So be sure to check out that platform and uh, you go to Odyssey and then you you go Christian.chapel.wichita. You type that in the uh, search that's at the top of their page and you'll see Christian Chapel Wichita pop up. You click on it and you'll have all the videos there just like we have on uh, YouTube. And um, it's a good group because they they don't censor. And um, I've seen enough censorship to know it's real and it scares me. But anyways, right now the gospel's free and we can get it out and we're free to do so. So we're going to keep it up. Amen. Amen. So let's read. Uh, tonight we're going to be in John 9. Uh, this week we're going to look at verses 8 through 12. So I'll read it as I always do. We'll pray. Uh, pray about some concerns we have. And then I will... Uh, We'll jump into the lesson, and of course those online, if you go to the Facebook page, I put the videos up, and I'll put up the outline too, so you can print it off, or look at it, or whatever you want to do digitally, if you don't want paper, you know, more paper in your life, you can do whatever you want to do there. So, here we go. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was, he was born, was blind, said... Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for every good thing that you've ever given us. But Lord, we can't thank you enough for giving us Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you came and you shed your blood so we can be saved, we can be healed, we can be made whole. And Lord, we can be delivered. And we could be in your presence, we could read your word, and your spirit gives us understanding. Lord, I pray tonight that you'll touch each and every one of us where we need to be touched. Lord, you'll confirm things, and you'll make this word make sense to us in, in our individual lives and in the individual situations we are in. Lord, I lift up Susanna to you. Lord, I just ask that you give her peace. Continue to let her, her husband, Emo, Emo, Lord, let him be healed and whole. And, Lord, we just ask that no more kidney stones. And, Lord, we just ask that, Lord, that, that they will both know that you are the healer. And we ask you to touch her mother in the surgery that she just had and let her see you do your spirit do that quickening power in them. And we give you the praise and glory and honor for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so verse 8 says therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen had seen that he was blind said is this not he who sat and begged all right in 6 and 7 we'll go ahead and just read it this is this is the first account that gets repeated four times of a miracle in this chapter all right and for those who haven't been with us Jesus does one miracle in this chapter, and everybody loses their mind. And you can also see all the spiritual warfare happening because we're going to see the spirit of unbelief. And you can go back um, a couple teachings ago where I just did an overview of chapter 9, and I point out all the different spirits that are working. Religious spirits, which are ugly and nasty. I've had to work with those. Uh, spirit of unbelief and... Uh, the spirit of a family, there's control there. We'll see all that later on. Yeah, just a lot of stuff, a lot of spirits happening. So here's the miracle. The miracle is this in 6. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said to him, Go wash into the pool, Salome, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. 
That's it. Two verses. Miracle. And the whole chapter unfolds from there. And you can see every demonic spirit that's not of God just go crazy. All right. So here we go. Back to verse 8. Therefore the neighbors of those who previously had, had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? So, looking at the action words, and again, for those who haven't been a part of my Bible study, I look at the Greek grammar and what it's doing, and I'll point out if it's doing anything significant. And if it's not, and it's just kind of understood in the English, you know, I just quickly say what it is doing and we move on. So, uh, Mounts, the, the Greek scholar, he translates what our, our, our New King James translates, had seen, who were used, used to seeing, they used to see him all the time. They say that in the present and, and active voice. So, real time, here we go. And then he was, who had previously seen that he was blind. Now, this is pretty cool. In this passage, I've noticed that they use what's called the imperfect tense. So, the imperfect tense means this. This was true, and it continued, and then it stopped. So, during this event that had a significant change, something stopped. What was it? A miracle. The guy can see now. <laughs> they use the imperfect tense in this. So, Greek, by the way, has five tenses. We have three. They have five so, yeah, anyways, going on. It's a very precise language, very precise. So, anyways, uh, so they said to him in the imperfect tense during this event, right, um, is this not? That word is, that, that's another verb, and so we're back into real time, uh, present tense, and active. Active voice means they're actively doing this. Uh, then we get to the man uh, used to set. Now that's cool. That's present tense, but that's also middle voice. Well, the middle voice means you do it to yourself. Well, what did he do? He previously you would do to himself, go out and sit and beg. So, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to figure that out. But, yeah, it's pretty cool how the language works. And then going on, and begged. Begged is just said in the, in the present tense and also in the active voice. The man actively used to sit in the middle voice and actively beg so yeah there you go all right yay grammar Mo moving on so the man comes back possibly to where he was healed now this is cool the scholar uh mitchell's j ramsey uh michaels sometimes i say Mit mitchell's it's michaels um uh, this this is the the bible scholar not the greek scholar the greek scholar is mounts all right he, he he brought this up and i thought hey this is pretty cool he probably came back to where he was healed. Yeah, but Jesus is gone. And now everybody's like, wait a minute. Is that that guy? Is that that guy that, wait a minute, he's walking around like he can see. What? <laughs> yeah, he, came, he possibly came back to where he was healed, and Jesus is not there because they're going to ask him. He's going to go, I don't know. He's not here from what I can tell. All right, I was blind this whole time. I couldn't tell. Which later, we see that he does not recognize him. So, that does confirm that he was blind when he, was, when, when he, when he uh, got healed. Because in, in 36 through 38, it says this. When he finally meets up with Jesus, he answers and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Jesus had to let him know later on when he ran to Jesus that, Yeah, this is, this is the one who... I'm the one who healed you earlier. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty cool insight there. And uh, we see this crowd get divided as those in the temple did earlier. Now, those in the temple, they were being divided over who Jesus is and if he's of God. Here, they're divided over what in the world just happened. All right. So, just to, to, to look at the people back in the temple at tw uh, in 7.12, it says, And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said, on the contrary, he deceives the people. 
So later on in chapter 9, we will see the Pharisees say, well, he couldn't be of God because he's a sinner. And then the, and then the blind man challenges that and goes, well, that's a marvelous thing. <laughs> God, God listens to sinners. Oh, wow, yeah, there's a whole theological thing to chew on later. All right. Uh, 24 through 7 said this. Now there was much. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, "Is he not uh, him who they seek to kill?" But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do not the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? You see them debating, right? Twenty-seven. However, we know that this man, where, where this man is from, they think they know where he's from. But yeah, they didn't know the Christmas story. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Yeah, maybe it's him. <laughs> let's, let's go back the other way. And then uh, a few more verses in chapter 7. Uh, Therefore many from the crowd, when they had heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. Guess what the, blind, the former blind man is going to call him when the Pharisees start pressing him. What do you think about him? I guess he's a prophet. Uh, maybe he's a man of God. We're going to look at that in the notes here pretty soon. All right. Okay, what were the crowd doing? Um, well, if he's not a heretic like the Pharisees and rulers think he is, maybe he is a prophet. Prophets stirred up a lot of trouble. Study the prophets of the Old Testament. They stirred up trouble. People didn't want to hear what the Lord actually had to say. They didn't like the message. All right, going on. Others said, this is the, the Christ, but some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Because nothing comes out good across the tracks or on that side of the lake, you know. All right. And then has the scriptures not said that the Christ will come from the seed of David? Yeah, check out where Galilee's at in Bethlehem. From the town of Bethlehem where David was? So they were divided among the people because of him. So we see the same thing happening, but they're divided over the guy who can obviously see now. They can't believe the miracle. So with all that said, verse 9. Here we go. Some said... This is he. Now, this is comical. Others said, it is like him. He said, I am he. <laughs> is that Mel? That looks like Mel. And Mel says, yeah, it's me, John. It's Mel. Okay, he's here. Okay, Mel's here. All right, yeah. It's comical. It really is. All right. Yeah. So, they, um, okay, so, um, yeah, where was that? Nine. So, some said, that word said, again, we're back in the event. It's in the imperfect tense. They said, this is he, right? So back to, back to uh, a present time, they're asking this. And then others said, again, back to the uh, uh, imperfect tense, meaning during that event, this was true, but something changed. And then uh, he, uh, uh, he looks like him, <laughs> back to presently and actively what they were saying and then they kept saying now that's cool the scholar just shows something here that we don't pick up in the English he said it in the imperfect tense what our, what our um, King James how they translate it here is that so they said this is he others is and then they said it's like him alright is like him the way Mounts translated it is they keep on saying so, think about the rest of this passage. They keep on asking him. They keep on asking because eventually he gets wore, wore down with them. And finally he says, look, I'm he. I, this is me. You know, why you know, why you, why you still question me and you don't believe me? And then he has to do the same thing with the Pharisees later on. What is going on here? During the event, in the imperfect tense, that means a, a thing continued on for a while, then came to a stop. They were continuously asking him these questions. See what the Greek's doing? It's painting a word picture for you. You can see the event happening. That's how, that's, that's how yeah, that's how cool, that's how precise I, I geek out with the Greek, I know. John's a geek, yeah. Because the Greek is so precise, it can actually paint a, a picture for you as it's, as it's describing what's going on. And then, and then back to present in real time, he says, I'm he, <laughs> I am he, all right? Settle down. And they're still asking them. They kept on saying, right, in the imperfect tense. All right. So, their confusion could also be from his demeanor and appearance changing. Now, that was kind of cool. The scholar brought out, 
maybe they saw something different in him. Not only could he see, but maybe there was like a light about him. Pretty cool thought, yeah, like a glow or something, you know, or, or you know, when God touches a person's life, you can see, sometimes you can see the spirit just radiate out of a person, and they don't look the same, right? Um, it happens, yeah. But, but this much we do know, and this is where the scholar says, he says, but it's, you know, but it's mainly from their natural difficulty in believing that such a miracle can occur. That was their problem. That was, that was obviously their main problem. And he says, look at verse 32. And this is, the, this is the man talking later on to the Pharisees who are about to throw him out of the temple. He says, since the world began, it, it has been unheard of that of anyone opening the eyes of one who was born blind. The miracle was so unbelievable, they couldn't believe it. All right. Now, what's the word in what's the big word in John? Exactly. We're going to see that here in a minute. They could not even believe. All right. Well, they're in the right book, and we know what the problem is. All right. We see this man do as Jesus had to do. Now, here's another cool thing. The man is not even saved yet. He was touched by God. We're going to see the saving faith at the end of this. But he starts to step in the role of Jesus and just start giving truth. All right? Looking back at 426, this is when Jesus was dealing with the Samaritans and he was talking to his disciples. Uh, no, he's talking to the woman at this, at this instant. Jesus said to her, I who speak... Am he? Because she was saying, well, you know, when the Christ gets here, when that prophet gets here, when that Messiah gets here, we're going to know everything. He's like, guess who you're talking to, hon? All right. All right. Verse uh, 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 620. Again, compare that to the, the man born, born blind. Is that him? Yeah, I can see now. No. Yeah. All right. 620. But he said to him, It is I, do not be afraid. He had to do the same thing with his disciples. They were scared in a boat going, Is that a ghost? No, it's me, Jesus. Calm down. <laughs> right? He's had to do it. He, uh, he, the, 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 the blind man's doing the same thing. 824. Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Well, the, the blind man is, is doing what Jesus is doing, but this one's a little more serious. If you don't get this, people, you're going to miss out who I am. The blind man's just going, I'm sorry you don't believe, but uh, yeah, it's me. You know, uh, Verse 28 in that same chapter, Jesus said to him, If you lift the Son of Man up, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I, uh, I speak these things. Jesus had to continue to convince people, I'm giving you the God-honest truth. Back to the blind man. All I can tell you is, his name was Jesus, and he healed me. That's all I can tell you right now. I don't know why you're flipping out. <laughs> Jesus is going, I'm giving you the truth. Look up scripture yourself, right? Uh, and then in 58, um, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And that's where Jesus almost got killed. All right. So, he's doing something that Jesus had to do and identifying himself to the confused crowd or person. Now, let's look at 728. 728 was this. Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple and said, You both know me and you know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. Jesus had to finally cry out to these people and say, I am who I am, and you know it, but you're refusing it. Well, we're, we're going to see, we'll see the blind man do what Jesus does. He's going to get exhausted here. So, what this text does confirm so far that an unbelievable an unbelievable miracle for these for these people has happened and a miracle worker has been there to do it 
that as much as they can figure out and believe, or their problem is not believe yet. All right, verse 20, or 20, 10. Not doubled, uh, subtract. <laughs> subtract 10 from 20. There you go, verse 10. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? So they asked him, and they kept asking him, and they kept asking him in the imperfect tense, and they were asking him and asking him, and finally what did they do? They asked him the right question. How were your eyes open? Aorist tense, passive voice. They finally acknowledge, okay, a miracle happened. Passive voice means you allow it to happen to you, right? So they finally said, how did God do this to you? They finally asked the right question. All right. So we'll just look at the notes real quick because there's just really only a few things you can say here. The people here in the text now speak as one. And we've seen the Gospel of John do that, haven't we? All of a sudden, everyone, uh, uh, the whole confused crowd and what everyone's doing, finally the, the Gospel writer will put all their voices together like one person talking. They finally ask as one the right question. And, yeah, and they, and, they, and they ask the right question to get him to tell the story of how Jesus opened his eyes. Here we go. Verse 11. All right. Jesus answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go wash in the pool of Salome. Salome, sorry. Salome, not Shalom. Not other Hebrew words that are in my mouth. All right, Salome. There we go, we'll just call it that. And wash. So he went and washed, and I received sight. So, he answered, in the aorist tense, that's just a general past tense. It means it happened passively. That's just how conversation happens. You just kind of give and take, you know, passive and active. All right. So, he receives their question, and then he speaks. And he says, the one called Jesus, a man called Jesus, right? He says that presently and also in the passive voice because it happened to him. Um, he made clay, just uh, airs tense in the active voice, and then uh, Mount says dabbed, or our translation in the, in the New King James says anointed. He's just telling the story. Yes, airs tense, this actively did happen. And then, he, and, and, and then Jesus said to him, airs in active uh, voice, uh, go. Now here we go. Present tense, active voice, imperative move. Like I said back when the miracle happened, the Greek grammar gives you a clue into how to, how to grow in spirituality. When God tells you to do something, do it. When he said go into all the world and preach the gospel, that means your neighbor that, that's a joint to you in the backyard. <laughs> yes, it means him too, right? Wherever you may be as you go. And then he told them to wash. That's also in the... The, uh, that's in the aorist tense, but this time it's in the middle voice. Well, if you said, I took a shower today, in ancient Greek, you'd use the middle voice. That's what you did to yourself, right? He went and washed and cleansed himself. And then, and then he goes, and then I went, right? Um, I went and washed. So he's retelling that, yeah, he did that. He's just using the aorist tense. Again, washed is in the middle voice, of course. And then I was able to see uh, airs tense and active voice. It happened, basically, in the Greek. The Greek's just using general tense. It, it happened. I can now see. All right. So that's what the Greek grammar is doing. Moving on from that. A man called Jesus. Now, this is cool. Here's the reason why you should have left your house and came to church. Here's something cool. This lets us know that, that sometime in the event, without the author John letting us know about it, telling us in the account that Jesus did tell the blind man his name. Now think about that. We don't get that in the story, but he knew who he was. Pretty cool. A little bit of nugget of insight right there. Look at that. So the blind man knew who Jesus was. He knew that his name was Jesus. He knew he was a man. 
and he knew that his name was Jesus. So while he was dub dobbing it, maybe Jesus said, my name's Jesus, just hold still. <laughs> yeah, you know. But something happened where he knew his name. Pretty cool. All right, but moving on from that note, he most likely did not know about the saliva. Did you catch that? Well, what does that tell you? It confirms the miracle. He couldn't see. Did you see him spit on the ground? People could have been spitting all around him. He didn't know. He was blind, right? Maybe have heard something go, you know, but, <laughs> right? And then he made the mud, but when he made the mud, he definitely felt it applied. All of his other senses were working. So what's going on with this verse confirms the story, right? So at this moment, he only knew him as a man who, who is a healer, but later he will call him a prophet in verse 17, and a man of God in verse 33, in defiance of the Pharisees who continue to question him, but not believe. What's the big word in John? All right, here's the next, here's the next, here's the next note. When he does talk to Jesus again, he wants to know who he is so that he can believe. And that's what I'm saying. A miracle happened to him, but later on he gets saving faith. And uh, so let's look at verse 36 again. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe? We'll just go ahead and read the next. Jesus answered him, You both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. I have never seen an unsaved person worship Jesus. Haven't seen it yet. That would be, be quite a display. But every person who worships Jesus believes Jesus, and they are saved. Amen? He got saved. All right. So there you go. You can have faith, but you can also have saving faith. There's a little bit of a difference there. I know people who believe there is a God, but they're not for sure which one. Well, you can have faith in God. You can. But you can actually not be saved. And a lot of people who come into the church, they believe there is a God, but they, 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 because life has been so hard, they don't believe that God will do anything for them, but they come to check and see, well, maybe, maybe he does love me, and they want to know. They got faith, and they're seeking, but they're not saved yet. But then they find out that Jesus is love, and that he does want them, and they get saved. All right, so he does receive his sight. He does exactly what Jesus tells him to do. He finds out that the power of God is real, that this guy is not some fake guy. And we get to verse 12. Then they said to him, Where is he? And he says, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so they say to him in the aorist tense, active voice, Where is he? Present and active. He replies presently and actively, I don't know. Now that's interesting. He says, I don't know in the perfect tense. Well, Pretty soon, <laughs> pretty soon in the perfect tense, he's going to get saved. The perfect tense means an event has taken place that has forever changed. And I've noticed that when you see perfect tense in, in Scripture, loosely about nine out of ten times it's talking about someone's salvation, or it's used in a way that only God could change that tense. Well, does he find God? Yeah, he does. Right? Right now, it's right now we just take it as a very strong tense I have I don't have a clue where he is or how to find him that's how I take it but does he seek him Jesus knows he's, he's wanting to talk to him again so what does Jesus do he comes find him isn't that how salvation works you find out that God's hand of grace is really stretched out to you and you put your hand of faith in there and find out he's there yeah confirms a lot of cool things that we know about the Bible and how it works all right and salvation so here we go so we see Jesus exiting the story as he's done before back in 711 we'll look at this then the Jews sought him at the feast and said where is he right now people are asking in this chapter where is he well what did Jesus do St he exits stage left by the father's directive right and I've taught that before on the gospel of John I'll go ahead and teach it again 
Jesus listened to everything the Father told him to do. Pentecostals in the past told us that it is imperative, imperative. At nauseum, they taught, you must be led by the Spirit. Why? So you can be smart in what you're doing and live and be effective, right? Jesus, if he, did not, if he did not hear the Father do it, he would not have done it because he understood his life was in danger, which we're about to look at. And people were asking, where is he? Which lets us know that his life still most likely is in danger, and the leaders do want him to be arrested. 513, they talked about, they talked about it several times, but 513 is one of them. They want him to be arrested. But the one who was healed did not know where he was, for Jesus had withdraw a multitude in that place. Right? I bet I was supposed to put another scripture in there. But afterwards, Jesus found him at the temple. Yeah, so this lets you know that uh, another miracle that he did, and then Jesus exited and then came back around. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said, See that... See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So Jesus goes back and over and, and, seats and, and, and seeks him. Now let's look at 7, 1, and 19. After these things, Jesus walked in, Galilee, walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judah, because the Jews sought to kill him. So his life's probably still in danger. Go to 19. Did not Moses give you the law, yet... Yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? So Jesus even confronts them about killing him. So they want him arrested and they want him killed. And that's probably still true. That's why Jesus again exited stage left. Let this whole chapter unfold. And then he comes back and he finds the guy and talks to him. So now this is cool. Here's another reason why you should have left your house and, and made this Bible study. Here's another cool point. The former blind man now becomes a surrogate for Jesus, meaning a substitute, and, and gets interrogated, interrogated by the neighbors and Pharisees. All right? Did that happen to Jesus when he gets back into the crowd? Yeah, they start to interrogate him. They start to question him. They start almost getting violent. The religious leaders have gotten violent. They have called for his arrest in one chapter we were reading, right? And the, and the, and the, and the people go to arrest him, and they come back empty-handed. They're like, man, no one's talked like him. And the, and, and the leaders go, you've been deceived too, right? Okay, no, actually, they heard truth and recognized something. All right. So, so with all that said, yeah, uh, most likely his life's still in danger, yeah. And now the former blind man is, is like him. And he's now getting the hostility and now getting the 20 questions, you know. They kept on asking him. They kept on asking him. They kept on asking him. He finally said, it is me, and I'm sorry you don't believe this, all right? But here's a positive note, and this is the reason why you should have came out tonight to the Bible study. Here it is. For the gospel writer, he, he becomes, in the narrative, a spokesman for truth. What are we supposed to be, all of us who've been touched by Jesus? We speak the truth. Yes, we become ambassadors of Christ. So, yeah, this man, all he knows is God touched him and a miracle happened. He's about to get saved. And all he can tell people is the truth and watch them lose their mind and, and can't believe what happened to him. And he gets interrogated. Pretty soon the Pharisees are going to grill him. He was getting 20 questions from the neighbors, but now he's going to get grilled. And then when they grill him, they're going to say, well, he's your disciple. You're a sinner. He's like, well, okay, well, I'll take him. He identifies with me, and he's obviously of God. So, you know, you, you have your problem, and I got my solution, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, my solution's now your problem. I'm sorry for your, for your situation. I don't know what to tell you. And then he even goes on. It's, it's funny. I mean, there, there's comedy in, in, in the scripture. He goes on and says, well, do you want to be his disciple? They said, no, you're his disciple. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking for him. Maybe he'll come find me. Yeah. 
I just, I just said it's impossible for me to know where he's at. I just said that, you know, back in verse uh, 12. It's impossible for me to know, but, but he's, uh, I don't know where he's at. So, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So that's, uh, that's our study for tonight. That's all the notes. We'll catch you later, Internet Church.